to We have to have the music. Thank you, Eddie Freeman, for creating our classic music for HCMA's podcast, Tales from the Heart. <clears throat> so I am still getting over my COVID congestion. So I ex ask for your uh, accommodation while I cough. So sorry, I'm going to try to put myself on mute for that. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is a big day in my family. It is July 15th, happens to be 2022. But on this day, uh, 27 years ago, my daughter Rebecca was born. So happy birthday, Becca. And I gave her cousin Jennifer an 11th birthday present of her own of a new cousin. So happy birthday to my niece, Jen, as well. So it's a big day in our family. Good morning, Marty. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning, Lisa. And also happy birthday from myself to Becca. Um, amazing. I, uh, it's hard to believe she's 27. As I was telling you, it does feel just like yesterday that I was eating sushi with her in Boston after her visit to Tufts, um, where she was, I don't know what that time, seven or eight years of age. It just seems like yesterday. It's incredible how fast time moves. Um, but happy birthday, Becca. Thank you, Marty. Okay. So today our topic for the podcast is um, Center of Excellence is the theme for the month and why do they matter and why are they important? So we're going to spend some time talking about that. And we're also going to, at the end of the segment, talk about vacationing with HCM and special considerations HCM families may want to think about when planning and plotting out their vacation so that they get the most out of their fun time away from their normal life and that they can truly enjoy their vacation and keep HCMA in the, or HCM in the back uh, aisle for at least a little while. <clears throat> Marty, yes. why is it important? For patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to have high volume center of excellence care models available to them? The answer probably first and foremost is that we have to sort of kind of appreciate that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you know, is a complex heterogeneous disease, which means that there's a lot of variety to the disease, you know, in terms of its expression, what could happen to patients. And therefore, you know, it's a disease, therefore, where, you know, there is a lot of um, weight that's placed on seeing lots of patients with the disease. You learn from that in a way that cannot be substituted by reading about it only or seeing only a few patients. So out of the experience of seeing the full breadth and spectrum of the patients and following them over time to understand what happens to patients too longitudinally, it's with that kind of experience that comes with a center of excellence that is seeing patients on a high volume basis where you, you get an experience out of that that really translates into better care for the disease. And that's really the essence, I think, of the, the rationale for you know, what you, you deserve an enormous amount of credit for, which is putting together a system in the United States, and that's what it is, a system and infrastructure of, of, of uh, centers of excellence, where that expertise is concentrated and therefore care is provided to patients based on that, that would not be at the same level without such centers. So that's the basis of it. It's a disease you gotta see a lot of in order to provide great care. That's the essence. So part of our patient navigation system is to help patients understand their individualized anatomy. Now you and I have just very clearly denoted that this is not our first rodeo. <laughs> We've been playing this game for quite some time already. <clears throat> what do you think? Well, let me ask it this way. How many hearts have you seen that are exactly the same? Yeah, I mean, we, we, I think what, what we often say is that almost none of these hearts are exactly the same in a way. You know, that is why we always sort of come back to the concept, the principle 
that HCM is an incredibly heterogeneous disease. Can remember reflecting back, you know, 20 years ago, you know, when you know some of those very early uh, HCM meetings in New Jersey, and my dad always putting up on, on, on as a slide. You remember this heterogeneity to describe the disease, and you know he he was right. I mean, it is an incredible spectrum to how these hearts look anatomically, the, the enormous diversity. And you have to really appreciate that kind of anatomic diversity, understand it in order to also appreciate how best to deliver care here as well. So, so looking at the diversity of anatomy, we also now have a deeper understanding than we did 25 years ago um, of some of the genetic variants that could be responsible for some of these anatomies the HCM mimickers, the phenocopies, right. and how to pull those out and make sure they get the right treatment as well. Yeah, I mean, I think people often say, so, okay, so what does the heterogeneity mean? It means that these hearts can look different, and they often do look very different. Obviously, there are, there are similar characteristics that define a patient as having HCM, but within that, there's an enormous spectrum of how the hearts look anatomically, and also there's a lot of diversity to what happens to patients with the disease over time. So heterogeneity applies not just to structure, but also to what happens to patients. And the reason is, the reason why is that? The reason is probably because the, um, the genetic diversity responsible in a large number of patients for this disease, incredible diversity in the number and location of gene mutations, and then two, and three are other factors that we have less uh, appreciation or understanding about, which are what we call kind of modifier genes. So these are mutations that are not the primary mutation responsible for the disease or the disease causing mutation, but other modifiable, modifiable genes that influence that primary mutation in some way. And then third, um, not to be discounted because it's probably also very important, although it's hard to quantify in any individual person how important is environment, what patients have been exposed to. Um, and obviously we all have different exposures environmentally, which also probably is an important player here as well. So we originally kind of came into the saying, oh, it's gotta be a gene disease and we'll have one gene and we'll have an answer and we'll know what everybody has. That didn't play out. And now we've evolved to the point of understanding that there could be a single gene mutation, a combination of gene mutations, and our environmental statuses, which are food, diet, air, exercise, viruses, all these different variables have an impact on how our hearts develop and how the disease develops. Exactly. So knowing all of those factors and knowing that, okay, that's the basis. That's where we're starting from. So, you know, basically clear as mud, right? Like, why is this doing this? A lot of variables but who are all the individuals that should be involved in the care of this patient? And how do you make sure in a very complex medical system that everybody's staying on target? So that's the model with a director or a clinical manager of the HCM program and all these other individuals who are needed, our electrophysiologists, our interventional cardiologists, our cardiac surgeons, our geneticists. There's this confluence of specialties that when working together are incredibly productive, when working in silos can be disruptive to the care of the patient because there's so much confusion going on. 100%, that's exactly So right. centers of excellence matter. That's right, the center of excellence creates the infrastructure to bring together all of those other cardiology and the expertise in those other areas of cardiology that we need to be able to provide patients the best care, EP, cath lab, surgery, genetics, imaging. You gotta be able to bring them all together so that everybody's on the same page, similar protocols, everybody's communicating together. Um, and there can be one gatekeeper who's you know, ultimately processing all that information to then provide the patient you know, the kind of input and consultation that they need but it's gotta be a team effort and, and the centers are, are set up. That's the whole idea. They're set up to be able to do that, to bring it together. So I wanna go back and do a little historic view of this. So 
I also had another epiphany this morning as my daughter woke up on her birthday. I realized that I started the HCMA when I was 27 years old <laughs> and my daughter just turned 27 years old. So number one, I can't believe I was 27 years old when I started this. It was amazing. I, that is, that, when you told me that this morning before we started, I couldn't believe that either. Um, it is, it's incredible. It reminds me of kind of when we found, you know, when you hear that Dr. Brunwald started the, the at NIH and leading that, the, uh, that, that branch uh, at, at, I think in his late twenties as well, it's hard to believe, you know, you guys were able to start to accomplish so much so early. Hats off to you. It's amazing. You know, I didn't realize it at the time that it was anything unique. And now I look back, I'm like, damn, I could have made those 30 under 30 lists all over the place if they had them back in the day, <laughs> but we didn't do that. So anyway, um, when I started looking around for care models at that point, there were your dad who was in Minneapolis at the time. He had just left the NIH. So you had the NIH program, which was problematic for other reasons. Your dad's program, Mayo in Cleveland. Mark Sherrod was seeing, I think he had like 150 or 200 patients in New York City at the time. Um, the Brigham was doing research, but not a lot of clinical. And those were the first programs. Those were where we were like pipelining people too. And over time, it was very clear to me that A, most people can't afford to fly to a doctor. B, it's not always great to have your doctor, you know, four states away. And that we needed to develop a community. And then I started going to AHA and ACC and Heart Rhythm Society meetings and meeting people and trying to get them interested in career paths in HCM. That was my human resource side of me trying to like build a business, but not a business, but build a system. Right. And it's 27 years later, and there are 45 of these programs now in the United States, more coming. Um, but I get questioned a lot, like, how do you pick a place Number one, we don't pick them. They have to come to us and ask to be part of the network. And there's a process, but we wanna make sure that people are getting really high quality care. And we don't see HCM care. And I'm gonna ask you for your feedback on this. The same way as, you know, bypass and cardio, you know, just regular coronary artery disease care and your general cardiology. You can't go to every single hospital or every single doctor and expect high level comprehension of a complex disease that can is got a genetic basis and has all these different anatomical findings and potentials for arrhythmias and structural abnormalities. You can't expect that from every hospital under the sun because it's a subspecialty care model. That's right. Um, That's right. Am I right? Do it, should, should it be available everywhere? Could it possibly be? I don't see how it could happen. No, no. I mean, it can't because, you know, of all the things you just said, and also it's just not a common enough disease to create the kind of level of experience based on seeing a lot of patients that we just talked about in the beginning that lead these in centers that you need. So it's just not common enough to begin with to really support that kind of idea that it, that every hospital in every major city would have uh, an expert HCM center. It just, it won't, we'll never be able to get to that point. I don't know if we, if we need to, I think either, I think, you know, as long as we can provide excellent number of HCM centers to which the vast majority of Americans have access to, you know, through a amount of travel, that, that that's a, you know, that's a goal that I think you, you may have already achieved at this point, and you could comment on that. But I think that's, that, that's sort of where we're, you know, that's what we're looking at here, because we won't be able to really beyond that and then still be able to provide the level of care and excellence that you need. Something will suffer if you try to do that. And that will be, you just won't have the, the kind of level of, of, of expertise that you need. That'll be the downside. So I think we, we probably have about another 20 or so programs that could be built out in regions of the country that don't have coverage right now. And I have to say, no two centers are exactly alike. Right. They have different people. They have different infrastructures. They have different access points. They have different insurance coverage availability. Some of them are closed systems. Some of them are community-based. Some of them are academic-based. So, so there's, there's some variability in the model. But I don't think that every hospital in every major city should have one. 
because you're going to dilute the experience. And when you get the really complex stuff, exactly. they're going to be shooting in the dark because they've never seen it before. That's the right word. You, you dilute You dilute when you do that. You, you, you create a situation where you just don't have the, the level of, uh, of, of expertise that you need. That's right. So that's exactly right. And I also want to sort of say one other thing. So I think, you know, um, that part of this discussion too is, you know, we talked about the fact that this is a disease where the, the centers are, are really incorporating a number of different um, areas of expertise in, in the service line to provide HCM patients the highest level of consultation care, EP, cath lab, surgery, et cetera. Um, and I think also this is, I'll just draw the first, I think that, that, that part of that too in the future will be being able to do that in the right environment. And what I mean by that is, you know, one of the things I learned over many years where I was before we moved to our new location is that the new location that we are at, Leahy, you know, what we, one of the major drives that, that led us to, to this was the opportunity to provide that experience for patients in a way, in a journey, in a way that was as comfortable and as efficient as possible. That's, an, that's the other aspect of the center of excellence, being able to provide and strive to provide patients access to excellent care that is comfortable and provides a journey, because it's a journey. We're talking about a lifelong disease. Absolutely. It can be accessible and easy. And, and part of that is being able to provide those services under one roof in a way being able to come check in, get your imaging, get your EP evaluation, get your consultation with your HCM expert, kind of all in one area. And I think that is what I hope we and others will, will, will move to a way, that kind of model that will also, by the way, incorporate a more holistic approach as well. Centers that are under one roof will have the opportunity to provide also kind of the other elements that we're trying to also incorporate into the care of a longitudinal care of HCM patients, okay. Psych psychological services, you know, health and nutrition, weight loss, um, social services. Maternal so fetal health. That's yeah. right. All Imagine being able to provide all of that under one roof that would ultimately define a, a, a contemporary center of excellence. So, we talked a little bit about the history. And then one of the major milestones in the development of additional programs actually came from your former uh, colleague, um, Jim Udelson, mm -hmm. when he approached me at ACC and said, I think we want to build one of these programs at Tufts. And I think I want to tap Marty Marin to come run it. I'm like, I think that sounds like a great idea. And working with him and looking at what existed elsewhere we created the basis of what the program should start at. Like what, what's the, what does a new HCM center look like? Yep. And then the program evolved and developed and added all of these features. And then other programs added some other features. And we started to bring all these best practices together. And it, it's now we've moved to a different location and a different name, but it's still all of those core concepts plus plus. So yep. more room, more accessibility, easier access. Um, one thing I find interesting about cardiology programs in old hospital systems that are in cities, it's a bitch of a walk for the patient to get yeah. to the clinic. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, oh yeah, you can get a transport, but who wants to get a transport? You just want to walk there. Um, so having institutions keep in mind, these are cardiac patients that may have a, a difficult time walking long distances and through hallways and down there to get their echo and over there to get the EKG and their blood work is over there. So as we build new centers, we want to think about the whole experience. That's right. That's right. So I think that's critically important and research, research, research. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So out of the idea that you create centers where, you know, the, there's a concentration being and evaluating patients and their families with this disease comes the infrastructure as well to more easily put together the kind of information um, that is ultimately powerful in research, right? 
So you've consolidated the HCM care and out of that comes the opportunity to organize and assemble important information over long periods of time that then can be accessed in a much more efficient way to answer question, research questions about the disease. So they're tied together, I believe, in a way. <laughs> so I'm going to say something an ounce controversial, probably. Surprise, surprise for me, right? I think there, back in the day, we looked at things in two separate silos. You had clinical care and research, and they were very separate. But the reality is we were dealing with a disease that's going to be with us pretty much our whole lives until technology changes that, cha changes that you know, paradigm. But you, you, you can do research while you're providing great clinical care. And we can get observations, and you're all going to be hearing a lot more soon about the HCMA's uh, new research database that we're building out with some partners, and you'll have an opportunity to participate there, but that's going to be from the patient experience, and that's going to be one side of it. But taking that, so what we're going to do, and then taking the clinical and the research and putting them all together and having everybody look at things with a similar system. Right. You'll come up with different conclusions and we'll come up with new observations, but this is the way to improve clinical care, research, quality of life. And I know this is not a patient's primary concern, but it is one of mine. I want to make sure that our partners on your side of the fence, Marty, the clinical professionals mm -hmm. find HCM a rewarding place to work and an exciting place to learn and advance the science because they're passionate about it too. So we want everybody to have a comfortable environment and a good experience because that's where we're all going to do better. That's right, 100% agree that was well, well said. I'll add to that too, just, you know, just the idea too that when you create centers and you're, you know, we, 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 we learn so much from the patients. I mean, we, you know, the patients are really the ones that teach us and show us and provide us the questions that we want to answer that ultimately go back to improving care for them. Okay. And, and that, you know, that, that is fostered, that, that relationship is fostered also when we have the opportunity in centers to interact with other, you know, other colleagues that are also seeing patients with HCM as part of the team uh, group, the EP, surgeon, you know, we, we talked about the patient. We said, oh, that's an interesting, maybe that's an important question. Should we, should we maybe investigate that? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of energy in terms of understanding what we need to do better for patient care that comes out of having a multidisciplinary HCM center it always comes back to the patients themselves. So one of the common things that I talk to an inquiring program about is do you have a team that knows how to fight productively with each other? That's right. And it's, it's a silly way of putting it, but I want you and Ethan to be able to go toe to toe and argue out why this is right or that is right or why you believe your approach is appropriate and hear the other person's argument as to why they see it slightly differently. Because we're typically pretty much aligned, but there's some nuance issues. I'm going to use an example that I have permission from this individual patient to share today. And it's the birthday girl herself, Rebecca. Um, so we're at a, at a decision point with Rebecca. And I'm going to get people arguing about what the right approach is. And we will talk about this offline later. Her device is 12 years old. It is time to replace her device. She has a capped lead from the Fidelis lead issue of 2006 or whatever that was. And her current lead is showing an impedance that's going in the wrong direction. The impedance rates are going up. So the lead is not 100% what it was when it was put in, but it's not bad. But... Her last device lasted 12 years. Will the lead in the next device for the next device last 12 years? Or are we going to go back in? Or is it time to do lead extraction? Get the old abandoned lead out, get the wonky lead out and put a brand new one in. So when she gets her new device in the next six to eight months, that she has new leads. 
I can get everybody in the HCM community to give me a different answer on this one. I'm sure of that. But everybody's input is going to help her make the best decision whether to extract now or later. But we need to hear all those different thoughts and why this strategy works over that. And we may never all agree on the strategy. The patient at the end is the one that gets to say, extract, leave, this is my choice because you've all given me great input. So we want people to fight that out. And I want to see you guys like argue management strategies, but not be negative or, you know, mean to each other, but just give your opinions. And not every clinical environment has the ability to do that effectively and in a productive, positive environment while still challenging each other's beliefs. Your input on that. Yeah, that's just, no, that, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, it's funny, you know, you were just talking and, you know, I was thinking that, you know, this morning, you know, every week uh, on Friday morning before things get going, we sit down, Ethan, myself, a lot of time had, and we just talk about ideas, you know, research ideas, you know, that that have come out of maybe a patient that we've seen or, you know, something that's come out uh, of, of a patient's management, you know, the, from that week or at some point recently. And we go back and forth and we, 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 we hash it out and we talk about it and we decide, you know, this is really interesting. This may be worth trying to find a way to, 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 to explore it further. And so that's exactly it. That would never happen without the center, you know, and, and the opportunity to have those kind of people around that foster that kind of creativity and energy. It goes back ultimately into trying to answer really important clinical care questions for patients. That's the essence. And having that tight inner group is yep. critical. And then you have kind of the next level of that. And that's your fellow center of excellence partners, where you can then say, Hey, we have an idea. You want to play with this idea with us. And then we have more data. And that's kind of where we're moving with the HCMA and our medical advisory committee to be more organized in that so that we can get everybody really working as a team in a different way. You know, we're doing pretty good right now, but I think there's more yeah. opportunities to do better and to expand the patient voice in research questions in a more formal way. So I'm really excited about what's coming next. So everybody has to stay tuned to, to see what we come up with over the next couple of months as we develop out our, our new system. But um, this is all in partnership and this is how we grow together. Um, right now I've got, you know, 17 other programs with inquiries in, in various states of uh, development. Some of them won't make it to the finish line because they, they just won't have the interest or they don't have the knowledge or infrastructure to build it up. And others will come onto the scene and become a new player. And it's going to take them, the newer players, it takes them time to get organized and coalesced and to become truly, truly experts. But as a start, when they combine those efforts, that's when they get the ability to really do the deep dive learn and put the time and energy in. So developing programs are good programs, but the experienced ones are where we're always looking to give the guidance to the newer ones. Yep. Mirror this, look at that, build it up like that. And don't be overly redundant in your services. Like we, we can do this collectively. The other piece I want to bring up real quick is electro or telemedicine and the ability to do virtual appointments now. And what that role might look like for people in rural areas where they don't have the ability to come physically see you. But with today's technology, they may not get the same level of imaging, but if it's not good enough, you can send them back and talk to their local doctors about what they might need to, to gather in imaging. But can you talk to me about what you think virtual medicine is going to bring to the HCM community? Yeah, well, I think we learned a lot about potential there in the last couple of years with COVID, since we really were forced, you know, to jump into that kind of technology. It was starting to pick up a little bit before that, but obviously things took an enormous acceleration uh, with COVID. And, you know, I think, I think there's a, there's, there's, well, 
I think I think there's there's gonna there is a place and going to be a place moving forward for telemedicine in 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 the care of this disease for sure. Okay, and the 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 potential for it though the exact you know how much of it will 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 it be to me exactly yet and what I mean by that is that there are a number of limitations and barriers right now that that are are preventing I think uh, our full full integration of of that kind of technology for example let me give you an example like during COVID the federal government said it was okay for healthcare providers to have telemedicine visits with patients regardless of what state they resided in uh, meaning that you, that I'm, 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 for example, I'm, I'm boarded in Massachusetts, uh, and that's where my ma- my license is. But at the moment now that COVID's over, I can't do a telemedicine visit for a patient who is living in a state that I don't have a medical license in. Okay, so that means that either I have to get a medical license in Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, all these other states, and keep up with that to be able to provide telemedicine visits to them. Um, or only confine that service to Massachusetts. So that's one example of a limitation right now that I think we need to, as a group, as a community, sort of figure out how to um, get around and overcome, or else there be a more, or else it's going to be a much more limited penetration of the technology in the future. It just won't ever rise up to the potential that it could have. The second thing I'll just say is that. Although I think it's a great technology and I think it's getting better in terms of, you know, how to access images and the, the, the of the of the of the of the pictures and um, the, the, the video and the clarity, et cetera. Nothing ultimately, to be honest, ever was going to replace the in environment and energy and, and that ability to sit across from a patient with a complex disease like this and take them through it in a way that they will ultimate out of if it isn't together. That's my view, okay? That, that you can come close, but you still won't get the, 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 the greatest benefit if it's not in person. That, that's my feeling, having done this for a while now. I don't know what you think, but you know, I just feel patients get ultimately more out of the conversation, the engagement, the you know the the the, the, the images, the education. If it's in person, I think in person is far superior to virtual. Yep. But when there's no other alternative, I think virtual is better than nothing. Local right. expertise and leaving it there. So when there's those abilities to to bring the specialist in, I I, I do like that. Um, I think it's. Okay, so let's just, let's be logical for a second and just be like real worldy. So if I happen to cross a state line, an imaginary border, um, nothing really changes. Your knowledge of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is still what it was before. And if I traveled into your state to see you, then your state license covers you. But if you come across the line to me, somehow it magically disappears. You're still providing care to somebody based in Mass- like you're in Massachusetts and that's your licensing or whatever state it happens to be. So I, I, I don't see the logic of them denying cross-border consults because it doesn't pass the reality test. You're still under a license in one state and I don't quite understand the logic of why that would change because it's over a telephone or a computer versus you driving there or flying. Like, like everything, it comes back to money. And I think it, if you kind of go back to tracing, it has to do with the insurers and, and, and having control of the flow of money for these visits and, 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 and so forth. So states have, you know, have been influenced, I think, heavily by that. Uh, that's a 10,000 foot you know, deal, but it kind of gets into that issue. Otherwise, you're right. It doesn't. There is no reason. There's. There absolutely is no reason at all. In fact, that reason I just said doesn't make that much sense either. Of course, but other than it serves the self-interest of certain people, but other than the patients. So you're absolutely right. But we need to find a way to get over that over that limitation somehow. And that is the role of the Legislative Advocacy Committee of the HCMA to bring those points to. 
regulators and say, dude, it doesn't make sense for us. This is ridiculous. Let's talk logic and let's just do what's right. right. Not what's going to put money in the insurance pocket, insurance company's pocket, because we're doing enough of that already. So I want to pivot with the last few minutes here um, and talk about two things. I want to talk a little bit about vacationing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then I have a reminder announcement for an event coming up on Monday. Um, so it's summertime, people are vacationing. What are Dr. Marin's tips for vacationing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, I think here's what I'd say. Um, have a good time. Okay. Everybody does, including patients with HCM. You need to take a break. You need to go on vacation. There's no question about that. And you just need to be smart, a little bit more smart about it, perhaps, and thoughtful about it, you know, because you have HCM. And, and that means, you know, sensible things like stay hydrated, um, maybe more so because it is the summer and you're traveling. It's easier to get dehydrated, you know, when you're traveling, particularly if you're taking um, uh, flights, long flights, for example. Um, so stay hydrated. And as part of that is, is get your rest. You know, I mean, that's really important too. Um, you got to take care of your body, maybe more so than, than pay than others on vacation without ATM, of course. And that means getting good rest. That means, you know, trying to eat well, um, be thoughtful about what you're drinking otherwise, and, um, things in moderation and just, um, uh, with activities, you know, again, try to be thoughtful about things you may want to be engaged in, in terms of uh, uh, things that kind of are, are part of vacations that you may want to think about doing. Thoughtful there doesn't mean don't do it, but it may mean modification a little bit to, to do it. Um, things like that, take your meds. Um, if you're flying, take your meds with you um, and don't check them you know, on the airplane. I think everybody's hearing all these horror stories uh, about luggage being lost and, and or at least not getting to you when you needed to. So carry your meds with you on the plane um, so that you have them. Um, those are the kind of things that, you know, I would say um, to be cognizant of. So I will add in that there are a lot of different kinds of vacations. There are vacations where you disconnect your body and your brain and you're out in a cabin or you're sitting on a beach and it's very sedate and you don't have a lot of mental stress or physical stress. Right. And then you have, I think, a more classic American experience for a vacation, going to a, an amusement park, being on the boardwalk and doing a lot of physical activity and rides and entertainment on that level. Um, we did do a little paper with uh, Dan Jacoby and the team at Yale a couple of years ago about thrill-seeking activities, um, roller coasters, like watch which ones you're going on, people. When I had HCM, I liked roller coasters. My body and my back don't like them so much anymore, so I don't know that they're going to be part of my future, but they were part of my past. And um, I was on one that had this like jet propulsion thing. And by the time I got to the top of the first hill, I was almost unconscious because it had so many G-forces behind it. And I thought I was going to like die on the, on the roller coaster. But then the next roller coaster I went on didn't have that propulsion and it was fine. And I learned I don't want to do the propulsion ones anymore. That was bad. So if you're going to do those activities, really stop and think about, should I do this with this heart? And really think about it carefully. Um, water parks, you know, it's, it's exhausting and you get dehydrated and you've, if you're in a water park and you're not thinking, well, I'm in water, but you're not drinking water. So you can get dehydrated, uh, a lot easier. So think about those types of things. And I know if you're a young family and you got little kids and they want to go do all these entertainment things, you're going to have to pace yourself a little bit because you want to have fun and you don't want to expend all your energy on one day and have three bad days to follow. So Take it in moderation, think it through, take breaks, um, get the rest, watch the alcohol and the salt. I don't know where it hides all year long, but when I go on vacation, I find all the salty food and all the really good drinks. So watch what you're drinking, watch what you're eating. Just be cognizant of what's going on around you and have fun. 
relax. Right. Anything people should avoid during vacation, Marty, other than the dehydration thing? I mean, just the usual things that we like we, we recommend avoiding otherwise or similar types of activities to those, you know, that that we often talk about restricting patients or the patients should the should avoid. Other than that, you just have to be thoughtful, you know, that's all. I will add one final thought on this. And I, I got stuck here many times myself. Um, we want our families to have fun. We want to have fun ourselves. And sometimes we may decide, I'm just going to suck it up and I'm just going to push myself. It won't have a good result. No good can come of this. It doesn't have to be a catastrophe, but it's going to make it less fun for you by trying to make other people happy. So have a... I started doing this this year. I have an expectation conversation with everybody that I'm going away with. These are my expectations. This is what I want to accomplish this trip. And here are my, this is what I need to worry about. And I set it in advance and I make sure like, like I went down to the Florida Keys. I need to get out on the water one day. I need to be by the pool one day. And there needs to be a tiki bar one night. This is what I want to accomplish while I'm on vacation. Beyond that, it's all just sun and fun. And I knew I wanted to rest. And I made it very clear that this was a restful vacation for me. And it worked. I found several tiki bars. <laughs> I found lots of fun time on the water. And I did think that I had set the expectations for. I have to say, I stole that from Brene Brown. So thanks, Brene. Um, not that she's ever going to listen to my podcast, but if she does, hey, girl. Um, but I think it's really good to set expectations and be clear. Uh, and if you have a child with HCM, have that expectation talk with them in advance. Look, I'm going to remind you to drink. I'm going to remind you to do this. So I want you to have fun and, and have a good time. So there's that. Um, anything else there, Marty? Yeah, I think that that's well said. Um, okay. Um, Monday at two o'clock in the afternoon, we are running a very special segment here at the HCMA. It is a webinar. You will, you can roll, uh, enroll for the rep webinar on our uh, website. Um, I don't have Ross with me today to drop links in Facebook, but I'll put one in there later. Um, we will be holding a session that I personally asked for. I did not know what I was asking for was such a complicated thing to ask for, but I've asked the representatives from Bristol Myers Squibb and the Cam Zios team to come please explain directly without a filter from them to the patients what the REMS are, what the label is, who their patient navigators are and how that system works and what the access reimbursement issues are and how they can, how patients who are interested can get enrolled in these programs. Um, unbeknownst to me at the time of the ask, this is not something pharma typically does. And it had to go through several levels of review uh, with the regulatory department to make sure that we could do this and you know, they've done all their due diligence, including notifying the FDA that they're doing this. So it's a very special event that's never really, this doesn't really happen. Um, and they will be speaking directly to all of these points. And in addition, um, I will, I've invited a gentleman from an organization called Patch, which um, is a cardiovascular um, access point issue uh, coalition that I belong to, we belong to. And this gentleman, Gavin, is going to come and talk about Medicare Part D and how it actually works. Um, we have a lot of people who are in that 60 plus age range that might be considering um, using CAMS IOS and they may have private insurance right now, which is one set of rules. And when you switch to Medicare, it's a whole separate set of rules that some people may not know. And we want to make sure you understand what your access points are going to be, where the costs are going to be going forward if you are interested at all in using the drug. We're not advocating for use or not to use the drug. We just wanna make sure you all understand exactly what the current access points are, what the financial implications are and how to navigate those systems. So join us at two o'clock. We're planning on about an hour and a half session. They will take questions. So whether you're a clinician, a nurse practitioner, physician, patient, and you wanna know more, please join us at two o'clock on Monday for that conversation. And um, I think you'll find it highly informative. Um, and on that note, I'm pretty much wrapped for this session of Tales from the Heart. 
and Marty, this is the last Tales from the Heart where I will be in this room. We got access to our brand new office today. I will be posting pictures on social media later. It's an empty office kind of right now. And we'll be moving in over the next two weeks. But the next time we do a podcast, you'll see our new station. We're very excited. We are doubling our square footage. Um, we will have a little bit of elbow room. We literally ran out of room. We had no more room for another file. And uh, we are going to have a lovely new office. Um, it's uh, still here in Denville, but not downtown. Uh, but we will still be part of the Denville community when we'll be right on the Rockaway Township border. So my, my commute got cut in half. It's now like four miles. <laughs> Everybody hates that part. By the way, congratulations. That's awesome. Well Thank deserved. You. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good time for us. We're growing and we've got a lot of good projects going on. So uh, mm -hmm. people will hear more about that stuff soon. Marty, hang with me one minute while I say goodbye, because there's one other thing I need to wrap up with you. Um, thank you all for joining this episode of Tales from the Heart. We'll see you next week where we will have Dr. Um, Alex DeFeria um, from UPenn, who is our big hearted HCM community member slash physician. Um, who's going to share some insights about his life with HCM and his clinical experience as well. So we'll see you next week. And thank you very much.